April. All right, so our last presentation this evening is our second keynote address. Oriental Moons, Western Days, Gene Gepser in Asia. And this is with Aaron Cheek, who's streaming in from New Zealand, I think. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Okay, so just a quick intro for Aaron. Uh, Aaron is a scholar of comparative religion, philosophy, and esotericism. He's the former president of the Gene Gepser Society. He received his doctorate in religious studies from the University of Queensland in 2011 for his work on the French hermetic philosopher René Schwaller de Lubitsch. His principal publications include Alchemical Traditions from Antiquity to the Avant Garde, Diaphany, a Journal and Nocturne, and The Leaf of Immortality. He presently runs Rubido Press on the rugged west coast of New Zealand, where he maintains an active interest in tea, wine, poetry, typography, and alchemy. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you for zooming in with us. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, um, so, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. 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 Excellent. Um, yeah, so my talk is, uh, as Jeremy said, Oriental Moons, Western Days, and that's actually a um, that title comes from a projected chapter in, in Gebz's unfinished biographical writings. Uh, he, he left us some, um, he wrote, he started writing an autobiography and unfortunately he didn't finish it, but uh, uh, what he has left us, I think is among the most revealing of all his writings. And, uh, but what he did do is, um, he sketched out uh, some future chapter divisions, which he, which he never quite finished. But the, um, the chapter that uh, would have discussed his travels through Asia and his, his, an engagement, his engagement with Asia was called Oriental Moons, Western Days. So I thought I'd acknowledge that uh, in the title of my talk today. So um, what I want to do in this talk uh, is kind of three, three broad things. Firstly, I, I want to just uh, give some basic context for Gebz's uh, engagement with Asia, his, his travels to Asia and uh, his writings on Asia. Uh, and then I want to explore two, two themes, the first of which is the idea of complementarity uh, especially of Eastern and Western technology. And uh, the second theme I want to look at is really Gebs' own insights into the nature of integral awareness and also his experience of integral or a rational consciousness. And uh, I'm going to be touching on a couple of the things that Hans has already um, touched on, uh, but also much more. So um, Gebza writes, on the very day of the beginning of spring and with a waxing moon, I departed Geneva on my flight to Central Asia and the Far East. There was no intention at play in choosing this date. It simply happened that way. At the height of the summer of the same year, I returned. And uh, as Hans has already mentioned, his um, his travels through Asia were, were quite extensive. He went through India, Nepal, Pakistan, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, and China. So, uh, and one of the first things he was kind of compelled to do, at least when he got to India, was to visit the, um, the Aurobindo ashram at Pondicherry. And, um, there's Aurobindo. And even though Aurobindo had died some 10 years earlier, he, he never, nevertheless felt, uh, as I said, compelled to, to make this connection with the, uh, with the Aurobindo community. Um, he had an audience with the Dalai Lama and he was also very much uh, connected with um, Lama 
Anna Gorica Govinda, the, who was a German, um, uh, a German Tibetan Buddhist Lama. Uh, this was independent of the, his trip to Asia. He actually knew he was reasonably close friends with um, Govinda directly. Um, so these were his main kind of ports of call in uh, in Asia. So upon returning from his trip, uh, he published a book called ASEAN Thiebel, which is roughly translated as a guide to Asia. And that book was reprinted a couple of times. And in 1968, it came out in an, a revised and expanded edition with the title ASEAN Lekelt Anders, um, Asia Smiles Differently. And both books had more or less the same subtitle, a contribution to the understanding of the Eastern way of being. Uh, and so this, this book was loosely pitched as a primer, a cultural primer for Western travelers to the East, but um, underneath that guise, it was really Gebs's engagement with Asia and Eastern thought um, towards the establishment uh, of a global integral consciousness. And one of the, one of the things he's, um, so, so this is the book I want to discuss today. I want to discuss uh, a couple of the main themes in this book and kind of like sort of drill a bit deeper into this kind of period of Gibbs's work. And I just want to mention that uh, I think with one exception, uh, all the translations that I am quoting from today are my own. And, um, and what I really want to do is, I mean, I've got a, a lot of dense quotations from Gebs, so I hope, uh, hope you've got the stamina for you know, some intensive quotes. But, um, what I really want to do today is, is kind of let Gebs speak for himself as much as possible. Uh, so in, in the first pages of this book, he, um, he's putting forth this idea that the East and West are not opposites. He's interested in this idea of complementarity of East and West. And he quotes Goethe, um, Orient und Occident sind nicht mehr zu trennen. The Orient and the Occident can no longer be separated. And in his own words, he says, Asia is the ergansung, the complement of the completion of Europe. And this idea of complementarity uh, he, he starts exploring this specifically through the uh, complementarity of Eastern and Western technology. Uh, and, he, and in terms of broad strokes of Gebs's um, understanding of the complementarity of East and West, it's very similar to Jung's position in, uh, in that um, this idea that the um, West, that Western technological development and mastery of the, or uh, mastery of the external world was understood as a compensation for the loss of an inner technology or an inner development. And, um, but then Gibbs has saw these, um, these kind of zones or these, these, these different um, levels of development coming together in uh, Western quantum physics uh, specifically in the complementarity principle of Niels Bohr, which was formulated in 1927, and also in the uncertainty principle of Werner Heisenberg, which was um, formulated in the same year. And what's interesting here is that both Bohr and Heisenberg traveled to uh, the East and were inspired by Eastern philosophy, uh, in particular Eastern logic, uh, and the, this, this sort of inspiration fed and informed their own um, scientific principles. 
And I'm not sure if you can see it very well on this image. This is a uh, statue of Niels Bohr outside of the um, University of Copenhagen. And on the base of the statue, you can see, you may, you may be able to see a yin yang symbol. And this was so, imp this is quite important to Niels Bohr, so important that he placed it on his own coat of arms. So you can see here, it's got the yin yang emblem right at the center and the, the um, motto or the statement above it says, contraria sunt complementa. So opposites are complementary. And so one of the, the principles that Gebser explores in this context is um, this idea of a uh, non-Aristotelian logic uh, that started to come out in Western quantum physics, but was also already present in uh, Eastern metaphysics. And so he talks about this either or versus both and uh, distinction. And so with Aristotelian logic, um, the, the distinctions are very, very black and white and very dualistic. And something is, is either this or that, and it's, it can't be, um, I can't be complementary or partaking of both. And, uh, and so what Gebser sees in the development of Western quantum physics and also in um, Eastern metaphysics is this idea that uh, there, there actually is a both and logic in which um, reality can, can be understood as a whole by uh, grasping both of its sides. Uh, just... Go back. I'm trying to read this quote, but my uh, video is kind of hanging over it and I can't see it. Um, just move, I'm just going to try and move my. No. Uh, just bear with me while I play with this technology. Um, I'll just try and roll with it, but just, just bear in mind, I, I, I'm not able to see my full screen right now. But Gebser says, what, uh, we know today that matter is not merely a spatial element, but also a temporal one. It is corpuscular as well as wave-like, so that both are merely different aspects of the same thing. So in the quantum idea of both and lies the decisive impetus which had led, question, led to questioning of the Aristotelian either or. By the removal of the either or limitation, the world, or rather the universe, has been transformed into a transparent or open one. And he continues, in 1960, I mentioned this to Werner Heisenberg. Uh, the open world by the removal of rational restriction reveals an unexpected wealth of relations. Since giving up the either or means giving up previous systematization, some people fear that they may lose all support and reliability for they are faced with nothingness, nihilism. Heisenberg confirmed that the transparent world is one of wealth and on no account a world of void, even though it seems to appear void. Now, if I'm well informed, Nirvana is both fullness and void, where the void has no nihilistic emphasis. And that quotation is actually uh, not my own. That's a, um, that come, that's actually published in 1969 in English in a book by uh, Saher. Now, usually when we, when we speak of Western quantum physics and uh, Eastern mysticism in the same breath, we usually think of this as a very new age thing. And uh, what I, I want to at least try to show is that certainly with uh, Bohr and Heisenberg, but also as we've seen with Gebser, this association has a little bit more grounding to, than we might first like to give it. But uh, it was certainly popularized in 1975 by the publication of uh, Fritjof Capra's 
the Tao of physics. And there's an interesting interview with Capra where he talks about uh, his meetings with, he uh, with Heisenberg. I just want to quote a little bit from that interview. He said, I had several discussions with Heisenberg. I lived in England then around 1972. And I visited him several times in Munich and showed him the whole manuscript. He told me something that I think is not known publicly. He said that he was well aware of these parallels. And of course he was well aware of them uh, because he'd spoken to Gebser about them directly maybe 10 years earlier. And also because of his own, um, his own connection with the East. Uh, Capra continues. While he was working on quantum theory, he went to India to lecture and was a guest of Tagore. He talked a lot with Tagore about Indian philosophy. Heisenberg told me that these talks had helped him a lot with his work in physics because they showed him that all of these new ideas in quantum physics were in fact not at all, not all that crazy. A whole culture subscribed to very similar ideas. And so just as um, Bohr and Heisenberg made a trip to the East, um, Heisenberg went to India, Bohr had a, apparently had a similar experience in China. So just as Bohr and Heisenberg uh, were inspired in their own work, their own scientific work by their trip to the East and their engagement with Eastern philosophy, so too, um, so too Gebser. And what I want to look at in the balance of this, this presentation tonight is Gebs' own experience uh, in, in Asia, his experience of the irrational or the integral consciousness. And um, as we've already, we've had a little bit, of, we've already been softened up for some of this by Hans's talk, which is great. Um, but I just want to revisit some of those uh, points and then um, take them a bit deeper. Um, so it was in Sarnath in India that Gebza had the experience that he, that he claimed was an experience of the integral or a perspectival awareness. Now Sarnath is actually the site of the Buddhist first uh, sermons or teachings. Uh, it was actually a, a deer sanctuary uh, and it was where Buddha, the, the Buddha first turned the wheel of Dharma and taught the, the laws of suffering and the path of liberation from suffering. So in the, um, I guess in the iconography of Buddhism, this is why you see the deer and, and the wheel of Dharma. Um, and so after he, after he had this experience in India, uh, before he went to China, he was in Japan and he, Visited, um, he visited Daisetsu Taitaro Suzuki, the, the famous uh, Zen scholar. Um, in the, the temple district of Tokyo. And he told Suzuki about his experience. Um, and, um, and, and Suzuki had some, some things to say about it himself. Now this is the this is the experience. This is what he told Suzuki about his experience. He said, "There had been no rapture to observe. I was not swept away into the irrational. There was no loss of consciousness of the world. Rather, there was the overcoming of the mental rational. There was a rational transparency, and with it, that intensity of consciousness that had integrated both the irrational and the rational in such a manner." that both were respectively available. And um, Gebster continues, the Zen master listened attentively with his head bowed and his eyes almost closed. He then looked and said with a smile of agreement, not irrational, but a rational, that's it. This experience that you had, it was not Samadhi, it was Satori.
So this idea of Samadhi versus Satori is one of the, I guess, major distinctions that Gebza makes in this book and uh, in, in, in other places. Um, and what's interesting is that he, he defines Samadhi in its trance-like aspects. And I know there are more nuanced definitions or even different definitions of Samadhi, but the one that Gebza seems to be rolling with is this idea that Samadhi is a trance-like state where you're swept away um, into this irrational uh, state where you almost travel into another world uh, you know, in, in a trance. So, um, and so he makes this distinction between the two kinds of uh, consciousness. This becoming trans, this process of becoming transparent, this complete absorption into transparency is in no way an instance of the weakening of consciousness that occurs in magical unification. It's not a cheap emotional trance-like unification or becoming one with the so-called universal world, but rather the intensely, key, uh, the intensely clear certitude that the assimilation into the transparency of the whole in which one becomes a participant is grounded in the non-duality of the spiritual. So it is not a, un it is not a unio mystica, but advaita, to employ the Sanskrit term. And so what is, he is, against this idea of samadhi is this trance-like uh, rapture in which you're swept away. Uh, he, um, he puts forward this idea of illumination into supra-wakefulness. Um, so he says, we in the West who have only recently made the leap about 2,500 years ago from the dream to the waking consciousness, from the irrational to the mental rational consciousness, must be doubly mindful that the great experience actually manifests itself as an illumination of consciousness. In other words, there should be a new elucidation and intensification of consciousness, which this time does not awaken us from the dream to wakefulness, but raises us out of wakefulness, vakheit, into hyper or supra wakefulness, uber vakheit. And so what he's, um, what he's getting at is this idea of transgressing rational limitations. That which we dare to speak of here is accomplished beyond the intellectual or conceptual reality. Thus, it remains mere conjecture for those who do not dare to transgress the limitations of thinking. Whereas for those who perceive it, it is, it is the transparency of the ultimately real. One cannot make this transparency visible. One cannot see it. Indeed, one is only able to become perceptibly aware of it through effortless intensification of wakefulness, uber vakite. It is more than clarity or illumination, more than transfiguration or glorification, more than radiance. One could possibly speak of it as the flashing forth or sudden shining through of the whole. Uh, this is um, the same quote that Hans read out earlier, the Duke Glenz Sein des Ganzen. Whoever participates in this is more or less purified, as if melted and remolded, liberated from the scoria of the soul, from the narrow limitations of mentation, without in the slightest way being lost to the world through intoxication or ecstatic rapture. And instead they find themselves perfectly in order, in the deepest sense of trust, and with the sacred lucidity of origins ever presence pulsating through them. Yeah, that's a great line. Durch Post von nüchtern heiliger Ursprungsgegenwärtigkeit. The sacred lucidity of origins ever presence pulsating through them. And furthermore, all of this occurs without sacrificing the concretely existing, presently available environment. But at the same time, everything objective is also elevated into transparency and thus liberated from opposition. 
uh, in this, this last phrase, um, in das Gegenüberlöser Wandelt, uh, literally means transformed into oppositelessness. And so that, what I've just, that the quotes I've just read uh, are Gebs' characterizations of his experience of the integral a rational consciousness, this raising up out of the, the mental rational mode of being and into the um, Überwachheit, the, you know, the super or hyper wakefulness. Uh, I want to spend uh, a, the next few slides looking at uh, his comments on how to get there and how to, what, what are his means or modes of realization. Uh, and as we'll see, it's, it's really about spontaneous liberation. We know not only from Jakob Burma, but also from Aurobindo and Suzuki, that they became aware of this light, this transparency, this transfiguration spontaneously, which means without prior preparation and training, it occurred as a sudden event. The Rinzai school of Zen Buddhism, which Suzuki belonged to, attaches great importance to this spontaneity. And while decades of monastic retreat and asceticism can at least lead to unio mystica, possibly even to enlightenment, the great liberation the awareness of the uncreated light, the transparency or the enlightenment, or whatever you call this event, cannot be forced. So any intention, purpose, or any volitional, any volitional efforts are obstacles. This does not mean that you should simply let yourself go or succumb to self-indulgence. On the contrary, it requires character and discipline, that is, emotional, vital, psychological, and intellectual sovereignty. It requires a tireless and persistent effort on oneself to enhance the purification and refinement that, to a large extent, form the requirements for entering into transparency. And uh, I, I love this idea, weeding the ground of being. Uh, the intention must not be directed to transparency itself. There should be no intention at all at play. Transparency has been waiting inside of us, has always been waiting inside of us. Um, and this, for me, this, uh, this, this line, transparency has always been waiting inside of us, uh, really resonates with the Buddha nature idea uh, that you get in um, um, some schools of Buddhism in which um, the primordial consciousness, the, the primordial awakening is, um, is ever present and uh, as I said, primordial, there's a sense that it's always there. It's not something we strive towards. It is the fundamental ground of awareness, um, which already lies within. So to truly, sorry, to, to try to grasp it by the forces of consciousness that are currently available to us, which do not extend to it, is a hopeless task. Our task is to weed the innermost ground of our being every day, to prepare this ontological breakthrough without squinting into the distance after the great experience. Um, and so, um, again, to refer back to this uh, Buddha nature concept as, a, as a, the idea that the liberation or enlightenment that we seek we already, have, we already have it, we have already attained it. It is primordial to our uh, actual being. Um, and usually in the schools of thought that um, put forth the idea of a primordial awakening, uh, the means of um, unfolding that are precisely 
like this idea of weeding the innermost ground of our being. It's about removing the impediments to what already is. So it's, it's not a path of building and constructing and creating towards a, uh, something higher. It's about taking away and uh, unmaking and unpacking to let the um, primordial awakening shine through. And this is exactly the analogy you get to use is it's weeding uh, the innermost ground of being because you're, the weeds will choke. Um, if you don't remove the weeds, they will choke the growth or the, at least the emergence of this primordial awareness. But if you prepare the ground, then the, prim the primordial awareness can unfold and flourish. Uh, and what's interesting is that he seems to be suggesting as a practice, instead of a structured meditation, like, like a formal sitting practice with a, you know, you might sit down for half an hour and you might have a specific visualization and so on and so forth. He's talking more about the unstructured meditation practices, which, uh, which, which are kind of, which pervade every instance of your life. Um, so it's about constant have that, having that constant vigilance to uh, to um, weed and and purify and refine uh, the ground of your being. And I've got one more quote I want to deliver before I wrap up. Um, and this is an interesting remark that he, remake, that he makes about um, the, the individual attainment or experience of integral consciousness versus the emergence of, the, versus the collective emergence of integral consciousness. And so he says, although this experience can be realized in individuals in human consciousness, it is nevertheless a manifestation of a transcendent consciousness. Whoever participates in it is also indebted to humanity. For every grain of transparency realized by one individual intensifies the spiritual power of humanity as a whole. And so to give a home on earth to this all pervading force, a conscious homeland is of decisive importance in today's world moment. So I think that's, um, I think that's a really interesting idea that what uh, it seems like he's saying that even if we can experience integral consciousness, it's, it's not like we can take credit for it. Um, because as we said before, it's not a, it's not something effort will um, lead us to. And there's a sort of paradox in that we have to expend effort and discipline, but what we attain is this effortlessness um, and the same thing here, you know, our individual efforts or our individual cultivation to, um, to unfold this experience both contributes to the, the greater human um, emergence, but also relies on it. So in many respects, even our highest individual states of consciousness uh, in those states where really standing on the shoulders of giants of all the, the spiritual of our, all of our spiritual forebears. And I think that um, really speaks to the, the part of integral consciousness that uh, emphasizes ego freedom, a freedom from the egocentric uh, basis of consciousness. Um, and so there's a lot more I could, um, I could quote to you today or talk about today, but I wanted to keep my talk, if not fairly brief, at least um, under time. And uh, just want to put, uh, my, put out there that um, my, my, web, my personal website and my press, Rubido Press, if you want to look at more Details about my work on Gebser and other things, those are the places you can go and have a look. I actually have, um, on my personal website, I have a bunch of translations from Gebser and uh, a long-form biographical study of Gebser's life and work. 
uh, which I'm presently expanding into a, um, a book length um, philosophical biography, um, which will be forthcoming through Rubido Press. And um, I also have Gebs' first book, Rilke and Spain, which deals more with his poetic apperceptions uh, of integral consciousness. Um, I have a complete translation of his first work, uh, almost ready to roll. And again, that's going to be coming forth through Rubido Press. So um, yeah, by all means, uh, stay tuned. Thanks, Karen. And uh, thanks everybody. This concludes, I believe, our presentations for tonight. Uh, so um, Aaron, this will be posted Shortly, I'm, I'm going to upload it uh, in a moment. So folks, elsewhere. Cool. Yep. All right. All good. All right. All right. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, wow.